Welcome to The Long Road. My name is Chris Roberts. I'm your host. I'm out here in beautiful alumni field with my guest. Alex Burrs. And Alex, I see you have a Swamp Bat shirt on. What do you do with the Swamp Bats? I'm the uh, team broadcaster. I broadcast live here at Alumni Field uh, for every game, and then I go on the road with the team. I'll broadcast around 1220 ESPN, uh, and it's it's been unbelievable this season. Last season, I was here as well. This is my second year. Last season, we broadcast through Cool 1031, <laughs> but the jump to ESPN this summer uh, has been unbelievable. And we were talking earlier, not all the teams broadcast live, do they? No, a lot of, well, every team broadcasts live in one way or another, but they broadcast in a way where you have to listen only online through teamline.cc. We do that as well because it's league mandated, but because of our fantastic fan base here in Keene, uh, it warrants the use of a radio station. And um, <clears throat> when we talk about uh, in Keene, sometimes you have 3,000 people at the stadium. What does it feel like to have 3,000 people? It's, it's really, it's not overwhelming, but it just makes you feel like you're doing something right. Uh, and when you're in the press box and you're surrounded by thousands of people, especially last season when we had our highest attendance ever on, a, on Independence Eve, 6,000, more than 6,000 people. I mean, when you're broadcasting in a place that looks like Woodstock, <laughs> you, you know you're doing something right. You know, sometimes some of the major league teams like Tampa Bay, they're lucky if they get 6,000 people in a game. This is true. Uh, but Keene doesn't need to be that lucky. Yeah. And even on a game where it's rain, even on a night when it's raining like crazy, you're still going to have 700 people just sitting around waiting for the game to start again. And before, as we were getting ready to set up, we saw a gentleman come in and he has two chairs. What do they do with the two chairs? Well, the chairs sit along the left field uh, out of bounds line, uh, right in front of the stands down the left field line, right next to the press box. And, and any day of the week that a game occurs, people throughout the day just bring along their chairs so they can call a seat and, and that I remember seeing that for the first time a few years ago just being blown away by that. And so if we get to the, the subject the topic today is about um, alcohol, different drugs, perform enhancing drugs that we hear about a lot with athletics but to be a really top-notch ath athlete you need to be as clean as possible and so we're going to talk about the effects and since you're the announcer what is your interest in, in this topic? Well, twofold. One, every announcer wants to believe that what they're seeing in broadcasting is pure. That's just the nature of the game. And when some news comes out that a player is not pure, then it really ruins the mystique of the game. Baseball is, a, is such a magical game, and it's something that a lot of people truly appreciate. And when there's even the tiniest of blemishes, it just can absolutely blow something Completely out, completely out of proportion, and really it takes that mystique out. Because people want kind of honesty in the game. They want to think it, it's kind of a fair game. Right, and when you use, when you use performance-enhancing drugs, at the time you feel like you are doing something right because you want to, to do so well that your intention is there. But what's lost down the road is that even though your intentions were at the time, you might think pure. As it goes you know, throughout a season, throughout even a career, you realize that the guilt builds up and you realize that what you did was so incredibly wrong because you also wronged not just yourself, but hundreds and hundreds of people around you who not only played with you, but also watched you play. And <clears throat> because if I'm an average ball player and you're an average ball player and I take performance enhancing drugs, you may never ever get your chance to play in the big leagues. But even worse than that, you might get your chance and then I might notice that you got your chance and then I would feel like I would be inclined to use them as well just because you did. And that's, that, in my opinion, is the real devil of the entire thing is because it, it, it breeds more use when success is attached to it. And your second reason is you're talking about your mom's work? Yeah, my mom is a social worker at a uh, day program uh, clinic uh, just outside of New York City. And uh, she deals every day with people who have just had substance abuse issues. And she comes home with horror stories uh, of people who have just fallen right into the deep, dark depths of abusing the substances that, that you know, they deal with throughout, you know, throughout the week. And it's something that is both frightening but also extremely enlightening. And to hear that at a, at a fairly young age was just invaluable. 
But what about if the people will go and say, well, steroid use or performance? That's not drug abuse. That's not addiction. It's something totally different. But success is addicting. And when you have success because of substances, then you, be, you yourself become addicted. Because you need more and more subs substances to continue that success. Exactly. Okay, well, thank you. And we'll bring on the ball players. Thanks a lot. Get well, we're now here with a, a guest. And Taylor, Taylor Williams. And where are you from? I'm from Camas, Washington. Uh, and I'm Dave Mahoney. I'm from Yukon, Connecticut. And, and so, what positions do you guys play in the Swamp Pets? Um, I'm a right-handed pitcher. I'm also a pitcher. Right, left-handed? Uh, lefty. So, well-balanced? Yeah. And you're here for a special message. And <clears throat> to me, Baseball is quite different than any other sport. You could be five foot seven and play, be a professional um, baseball player. You could be six foot eight. But if you go in basketball, it's physical requirements. Football is physical requirements. What is that excitement about that anybody, if they work hard, can be a successful baseball player? Um, to me, I think baseball, um, different from any sport, is is great just because like you said you can be any size and play the game and I think that baseball more than any sport takes hard work and I mean any sport takes hard work but baseball uh, there's so many levels of the game that it takes to make it to the professional level and uh, for guys like Dave and I that play uh, college it we know the path that it, that it takes to get to this level and it's just it's sometimes not fun, but it takes so much hard work, and it's there's so much discipline involved. Um, sometimes you're not always looked at in the limelight, just like like a football and basketball player might be, but um, that doesn't stop us from working hard and the mental effort and preparation that we put into the game. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I agree with Taylor. I think um, I think the best part about the game is that. Uh, you don't need to be super strong, super fast, or anything like that. I mean, that helps, obviously, but, uh, you know, a lot of times kids sort of get overlooked, but, you know, you just got to work hard, and, you know, you can still make it to the next level, you know, no matter what people say. So. In, in part of baseball, it's kind of a mental thing. You just can't go out left field in days off. You always have to be thinking. You always have to... Do I move in a position based on where my pitch is going to throw the ball? Who's going to hit? Do we going to shift? In a lot of other sports, it's just a lot of it's instinctive, but baseball doesn't seem to have that. Yeah, and I think um, I think that's a big difference with baseball from other sports too. Is um, you can be an amazing athlete and make it to the NBA uh, just on your raw talent. Uh, I think LeBron James is a good example of that. Or you can be raw talented and make it to the NFL someday but the difference between baseball and the other sports is that you're men mentally you, you you have to be so much more enhanced in, in the game and smart I think that's the difference between guys that are at the professional level and guys that are still at the college level or never make it someday is their their mental game and their um, their preparation just everything mentally that they put into the game that, that's the difference I think for making it to the next level and the guys that never make it. When you talk about the mental part, well, what would me having a few beers have to do with my mental? You know, doesn't make me feel better? Don't I think better with a few beers? Well, you know, I think every day you got to show up to play, and you know, having having a few beers or having having some alcohol that <clears throat> even you know the night before, it's not going to prepare you for the game the next day. You know, you got to be constantly thinking ahead and uh, take care and taking care of your body at this level because uh, if you don't, you won't make it. Yeah, I remember when Doc Gooden was playing for the New York Mets and he was a Sports Illustrated, they had an example of by the time he brings his arm up, it's like four tenths of a second and the ball is in the catcher's glove. So a few little beers, a um, few drinks or some pot may kind of slow that down a little bit. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> alcohol is a funny thing and um, I think that, especially being at the college level, we're, we're around alcohol and drugs mm -hmm. every day. And um, it's just kind of a part of life in college. And uh, being a freshman this year, I was able to kind of be around that environment and 
uh, know what there is to offer with college. And especially in a college baseball program, the stress and the work that, uh, that it entails. Um, sometimes, yeah, it gets stressful. And a lot of guys get to the point where they, they're so stressed out that their, their release and their relief from the game is to, you know, go drink alcohol or sometimes do drugs. Mm -hmm. And I think being around that has made me realize how, how much it really affects the way you play and your, your athletic ability and the way you present yourself every day on the field. And I just think that it's, it can hinder your game and your, your ability so much just on an everyday basis. And those guys that just, you know, relieve their stress, relieve their stress just a little bit that one day after practice or that one day after the game that they had a bad game, it ends up turning into a, a much bigger problem. And I think that it's just something that you don't want to get involved with. <clears throat> but um, what happens if I go and say, well, you know, I'm having a bad day. So someone comes up and says, hey, I got this new drug that will help you get better. You know, you're, you're a step slower than the other guy. You know what, this drug will help you get that extra step. Well, you know, I think it'll look good in the short term. I think, you know, if you're really struggling, you go, dang, you know, I need, I need something to pick me up. You know, that might, that might be an attractive option, but, you know, in the long run, it'll catch up to you and, you know, your, your body will eventually break down and it won't be able to, it won't be able to uh, sustain and at that high level. So, I think, you know, the best bet is just going out there, uh, you know, early work, you know, doing running, you know, hitting the gym, uh, just hard, hard work. That'll, that's what you need to be successful. The, um, you were talking about having a goal. When you have a goal, it has choices. And sometimes do I take the drink, do I take the drug, or do I keep working for my goal? They usually don't match up. If you go up, off the left field, you can't maintain your goal. I mean, having a, having a goal, it takes so much out of you. I mean, having a goal is dedicating basically your life to that goal. And I, especially for uh, being a baseball player, dedicating my life to the game of baseball, it, it intakes so much um, discipline. I think discipline would be the one word that describes that. And um, when you set your, your eyes on a goal, in my mind, that means that you're willing to do whatever it takes to achieve that goal. Through and, hard work, but not through drugs. Yes, through hard work. And I think that by setting a goal, um, it allows you to stay true to yourself, and it allows you to work towards something while keeping yourself online and being disciplined. And discipline is definitely, I think, the, the most important word with setting goals and being able to achieve those goals. And I mean, I think that drugs is just not, it's not a choice that it doesn't allow you to stay focused on those goals and be disciplined with those things. It, it's an easy way out and it's an easy way to, to just get over a bad day or not achieving something that allows you to get to that goal. We're off camera talking about in California and mm -hmm. Irvine and um, San Diego, but in a lot of cases, it seems that it's the parents' goal for you to be a professional baseball player. The parents' goal for you to get a college scholarship, but it may not be your goal. Yeah, that that doesn't work. You know, if as a parent, the best thing you can do for your kid is just, you know, let them be kids and let them let them do their thing. You know, whether it be maybe it is baseball, but maybe it isn't, and that's fine. Um, and you know, I remember my parents as a kid. You know, they. They uh, opened me up to you know a lot of different things, and they you know they didn't force anything upon me, and I think that's the biggest reason why I'm still playing because you know it sort of just came to me. That's the biggest thing you got to let the game come to you, and uh, so that's what happened to me, and that's that's the biggest uh, reason for my success so far, and why I've been able to make it here because. Uh, you know, if you're if it's about the parents, it's not about the kid. You know, if they don't want to really be there. If they don't really have that drive, then it just will not work out. 
you, you talked about drive, you talked about focus, you talked about going for that goal. But before, both of you guys also said enjoyment. Yeah, that's, that's the biggest thing. If you don't, I mean, if you don't enjoy it, you know, you're not going to set a goal to, you know, make it to the big leagues one day or make it to wherever you want to make it, maybe playing in college. You know, you just got to enjoy, enjoy the game for the sake of just playing going out here having fun that's that's why some of all so great you know no pressure from your college coaches or expectations you just with your buddies you know playing the game you all love so it's special you know, being up here in front of 6000 people bottom to last you get to yeah. win or lose the game sometimes you do it sometimes you don't and i i ran cross country and i played baseball <clears throat> in college baseball in high school cross country in college and we lost a lot of times. But it seemed like you always learn. If you want to be better, you learn from your losses. You figure out, why did I lose? How can I get better? And I think at, at, athletics teach you that. Um, I mean, yeah, I think that learning from your mistakes and uh, losing, I mean, I think it, it teaches you so many things about life in general. And just, uh, I think, wanting to to get better and to improve off of what you did wrong and especially playing in front of people as you said 6,000 people is an, an incredible I've never played in front of that many people before and um, it's it's for us 6,000 people is like playing is like playing in front of a professional crowd um, you there's nothing better than um, being the person that, that's looked up to and we, we always look up to people professional athletes like you know they're they're the star, and you want to be just like them. And when you're the person that's in the limelight at that time, you want to be the person that people look up to. And so you want to achieve, and you want to you want to you want to you know you want to be the person that has that game-winning hit or that that last strikeout to win the game. But when it comes down to it, um, if that doesn't happen, it's not the end of the world, and you know that it's still a game. <laughs> As long as you did your best. You That's know you went out there and did your best. Yep, exactly. <clears throat> and so we know that you, you have a message that you want to get out. You have a, a type of mentor program that you're trying to bring across. Can you tell me about it? Oh, uh, yeah, we're uh, mentoring for Monagnock Voices. Um, it's an organization here in Keene. Uh, we help helping out uh, young people, um, educating them about the effects of drugs and alcohol. Um, and you know, warning them about it, and so we, you know, we're going to go out to the surrounding communities and talk to some young people about uh, the effects of these substances. And when you're talking about how you guys look up to the major league ball players, last year my, my grandson, he was out here, he catches, he was behind with the catcher. We got pictures of him, and he was so proud, he was so excited to have his little uniform on, standing up to the, this big guy, swamp back guy who was about six foot four, mm -hmm. 225. Mm -hmm. And so your message is gonna be really important. You may be only 19 or 20 years old, but the seven and eight, nine year olds look up to you because you're at a level higher. Yeah, I think that's the, that's the huge thing with it all is that uh, to them, we are like professional athletes, so the message coming from us is much more important as it is coming from their parents maybe and I'm I think that it's not it's not to them it's not that it's not important coming from their parents but we are people that they look up to and do something that they share with us which is playing sports and loving the game that we love also and so look by looking up to us that and seeing us achieve at the the sports that they play it makes them want to do what we do to be successful, and I think that's the difference. The, um, like I said, my, my grandsons, they love to watch Sandlot and all those other movies, and um, I think it's the Sandlot one, the kid from Chicago Cubs, he falls and breaks his arm. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and there's a picture of him going, against, part of the film, he's pitching against Barry Bonds. Number 24, Pittsburgh Pirates, got the earring, the cross dangling. <laughs> And he goes, and like we're arguing, he says, no, that's not Barry Bonds, that's not Barry Bonds. And when you go and look at Barry Bonds, 
and he goes, oh, Barry Bonds got all these home runs and everything. And it was just really tough for a nine-year-old to say, no, mm -hmm. that is not Barry Bonds. When I grew up watching Barry Bonds before the pre-drug steroid human growth. And, and you could see kind of the hurt in his eyes when he was, you know, how'd you do it? I says, well, he used drugs. Yeah. And then it kind of just, no, he, he can't do that. Yeah, people at that level, um, you know, they're stars. And I don't know, I mean, thousands of kids look up to him. And, uh, you know, they trust them and they, they, they're their role models. And when they find out the truth that maybe they've been, they've used drugs, they've used steroids, um, it's just really tough for, for kids to, to accept that. And uh, it's not setting a good role model for them. It's saying, you know, it's okay to take drugs, take steroids to, to uh, be successful. And it's, you know, they're saying it's okay to take the easy road, and it's not. But what happens if I say, well, I'm Charles Barkley, and I say, you know what? I'm no damn kid's role model. That's their parents' responsibility. Well, I think, you know, that, that always happens. But, um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, up to, it's up to an athlete if, like us. Um, you know, we've, we have kids here that come to the games. They uh, look up to us. So I think we just got to focus on doing the best uh, job we can do possible. And just forgetting about the other stuff and just uh, focusing on how to be a good role model just for those kids. Because when you get the benefit of standing out here pitching from in front of 6,000 people or pitching in the championship game, from with those benefits comes responsibilities. Yeah, and I think the most important thing for me as a role model now is looking back to when I was five years old or when I was... 10 years old even and going to professional games or to even high school games my sister's high school games or um, a college game and seeing and remembering how much I looked up to those athletes and how amazing I thought they were and so I kind of have to put myself back in those shoes and remember what it felt like and I have to remember how great it would have been if one of them were to come and say something to me or talk to me or give me a ball or something like that. And that just always pops into my mind when I'm in the dugout during the game or when I'm walking down the foul line before the game and I see little kids asking for high fives. And that's, I think that's when it really hits me is that I am a role model and I have to be responsible with that and I want to be the best role model that I can be. And I want to, to be that player that the kids love and look up to. And, you know, I want to set a good example for them. It, it's kind of like that, I don't know if you see, that um, cell, cell commercial, phone commercial, where the dad finally gets a ticket to the football game. Oh, football, yeah, he yeah. throws the football, and then it has a multiplying effect over yeah. the years. Yeah. And so you never know how much of a positive um, impact that you're going to have on who that individual is. Every act that you do is pretty important. Yeah, you never know, you know, who's live you could touch or, you know, it seems like I was that kid on the fence like yesterday, you know, it's just, you grow up fast and uh, now I'm on the other side of the fence giving the high five, it's, it's, you know, it's an amazing feeling and uh, to be in that position is special and you just got to try your best and to just affect these kids positively in a positive way. So as we get ready to, to wrap this portion up, what would you want to say to some parents or kids out there? Uh, well, you know, I think parents, you just got to let your kids uh, play for the love of the game and just, uh, you know, kids just um, just focus on having fun mainly. That's the big thing. If you if you have fun, uh, you know, you'll, you'll work hard, you'll be successful, you know. You can't be successful uh, without fun, without having fun and enjoying the game. So I think that's the big, big part, you know, as a kid. What would you have to say? I would have to agree with Dave 100%. Um, if you're not having fun, then you shouldn't be playing the game. And uh, they say fun's the name of the game, and that's that to me is 100% true. And just enjoying being there every day and having an opportunity to play that sport and to 
be able to be with your friends and have fun and um, have your parents take you to the game and then come home after the game and enjoy the family aspect of sports and just looking up to professional athletes in general and just being able to have fun with it every day is the most important part. Because in, in some cases, parents push their kids so much to succeed that the children don't want to disappoint their parents so it becomes easier for them to take drugs, yeah. not to disappoint their parents. And so it becomes a vicious cycle of unintended consequences. Yeah, exactly. You, can't, you cannot do it for, your, for <clears throat> anybody else but yourself. If, if you're doing it for your parents or you're trying to impress someone else or this or that, what have you, you know, you're doing it for all the wrong reasons. You know, it's just got to be you inside. You really enjoy the game. That's why you're, that's why you're out there. That's a big part. And, and finally, when you kept talking about goals, goals and disciplines, when you set a goal on a ball field and you have discipline to reach that goal, people sometimes forget the discipline and goal setting that you learned on the ball field affects your whole life positively. I 100% I agree, I agree with that. And I think that for many of us that are collegiate uh, athletes, when you set goals on the field and you are able to achieve that, I think that it only carries off the field also into the classroom, which is extremely important at the college level to, uh, to be successful. Um, you have to set goals in all areas of life. You have to set goals in the classroom. You have to set goals uh, with your family, um, chores, uh, sports, everything. Uh, goals can really help you just achieve things in life that you want to accomplish. And, it makes you, it allows you to stay focused on what you want to accomplish. And I think that it's just as important off the field as it is on the field for, for anybody. Um, I want to thank both of you for being the guest. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck thank tonight's you. game. Thanks a lot. And that's a nice jersey, that new? Yes, it, it is. <laughs> <laughs> Looks good. I have to buy one for my granddaughter. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Well, I'm here with my guest. Joe Bogio. And where you, where you from? I'm from Hinsdale. I've been there for about 20 years, since 1990, and uh, excited to be here today. Matter of fact, I think the last time I saw you was maybe about eight, nine years ago when I was teaching at Hinsdale. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I can't remember if I was a vice principal then or not. But no, I don't think you were the vice principal. Yeah, I was then. still teaching math. You are still teaching, so you, you've moved up in there. So now I'm the assistant principal I'm at the middle high school there. We've got about 320 students. Uh, I also am involved in a lot of athletics, coaching recreational basketball, directing the Hinsdale Baseball Cal Ripken uh, as the co-president, and uh, just uh, enjoy being around kids. And I noticed at Hinsdale, you're adding, at the high school level, you're adding more sports over the years to the, your school program. You're getting more kids actively involved. Yeah, we're really excited. Uh, we were able to add cross country this year in the fall and track and field for <coughs> In both for boys and girls in the springtime, uh, led by uh, an English teacher at the school named Glenn Hammett. And, you know, we really see the importance in kids getting involved in extracurricular activities. The, uh, the, the kids that hadn't been involved in team sports that took part in cross country and track and field, their grades skyrocketed. It was, you know, it was just eye opening to see the improvement that we had. And, and it's gotten us to a point where we have over 50% of our student body participating in athletics. So I'm pretty excited about that too. You talked about grades. When we looked at the last New Hampshire, the kneecaps, you guys had a lot to be proud about, especially your reading levels, uh, one of the top in the region. Yeah, we've been working really hard on that too. You know, it's, it's not all that school is about, yeah. but it's what goes into the newspapers and is seen in the public eye. So we've been really working hard on on our mathematics, our reading, and our writing in every area, and, and just trying to create a climate where kids feel comfortable and safe and know that they can achieve. That's one of the biggest things, is helping them to understand that with some effort on their part, they can achieve their goals. It's not, it's not outside the realm of possibility for them to be successful any longer. I ran cross country and, and track in, in high school, and once I became more successful in track and cross country, it carried over into my grades. Mm -hmm. It just changed my perspective. It says, if I can be good here, I can definitely be good there. Right. There's, uh, there's a lot of research, scientific research, that indicates that, you know, <coughs> that athletic 
gets the connections going between the, the neurons mm -hmm. in the brain. Uh, a book, I can't remember the name of the author now, is Spark, that uh, mm -hmm. addresses a lot of those things. And, and, you know, the more that we, you know, we can get kids involved in being active, I think we'll see that. Give them something else to do besides drugs. And you're talking, you're part of the, the coalition against drugs and alcohol abuse? Yeah, it was, um, it was started way back in 2002 and by a parent who had a son that was uh, very negatively affected by his marijuana and other drug use, alcohol. And um, I heard it all through the time I came to Hinsdale in 1990 and over and over again I heard the kids talking about going out in the woods and partying. And, you know, I started asking them, what's going on? You know, why, you, you know, what's the story with this? And a lot of them said there's nothing else to do. So they get bored and they experiment with drugs and alcohol. And uh, we were lucky enough to be able to secure a grant with a lot of help from many members of the greater Keene area. And, you know, Lauren Brissett and Kelly uh, helped us write a grant. And this woman, way back was Denise Prescott who was instrumental in helping us and that kind of kick-started uh, and we got uh, some after-school programs going that kids were more involved in and focusing a little bit you know through the side door and the back door on staying away from drugs and alcohol and we've seen some good positive results going back to those classes of kids that you know there's still pockets of places where things that you wouldn't want to see happen are happening, but at least we've raised student awareness and now this, like programs like this, are our next step to really get the greater parent community and the rest of the community, uh, store owners knowing better what, uh, you know, what kids are using as far as over-the-counter prescription, um, not even prescription, but over-the-counter drugs that you know, I wasn't even aware of until this year as cough medicine is a big thing for kids to abuse. And so, uh, you know, we're just kind of taking the next step here. And I really feel I'm really happy that we're able to do this and make people aware. You know, I've seen a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of young lives ruined by drugs. And I don't want, you know, if there's one that can be avoided and by being out there up front saying there's other alternatives and helping them to understand what they are and building skills with those kids and positive things like athletics or fishing whatever it may be anything that can spur a kid's passion to be the best that they can be at that is what our coalition wants to do and we're lucky i think we're gonna have a couple kids go out to uh, anaheim california with some staff members this summer on july 24th to the 28th and you know that might help to that'll be the first pair of kids who have, go from hinsdale and it might help to really drive the uh, student population. So there's, there's, <coughs> there has to be some glamour to it yeah. in order to, uh, to really get the kids excited about it. And when you talk about, you know, if you take drugs or alcohol, it can, it can change things. You know, I'll age myself. 40 years ago, <clears throat> when I was a junior in high school, I was catching and I caught these two brothers. One was Mark Bomback and the other one was Herman Bomback. Mark Bomback, went to the major leagues, played for the Mets, his best year he won 10 games, and he played for the Mets in Montreal Expos. Mm -hmm. That's really dating so. <laughs> but his, his brother Herman was head and shoulders over him. They were always playing for the state champ. But he got drunk one night and he got his girlfriend pregnant. Mm -hmm. His everything just stopped. Instead of going on to the major leagues, he was working in the factories of Fall River. Right. Just because he made a really dumb decision under the influence of alcohol. Yeah, that's what a lot of kids don't realize is, you know, it's not so much that the alcohol, well, the alcohol hurts you, but it's those things when you're not making your proper judgment, you're inhibited and you're, you know, you're just not thinking. And, uh, you know, th those things can, not necessarily that it ruined his life. He may have had a great <laughs> life with his children and everything after that, but it changes your it life. It changes your direction. It's definitely that there's, a, like a friend of mine says, there's a cliff ahead when you start drinking. And that cliff, you might fall over it and run into some serious problems, or you may be able to see it and detour and not go over it. But it, it, it changes things definitely. And, and that's, the, uh, that's the key is to try and help people understand that. You know, and, and especially our young ladies, too, that get involved in, in that. You know, the boys sometimes will encourage them by providing alcohol and 
and then they're not making good decisions around sexual activity and and we obviously you got a problem there so we've been working really hard at the high school level educating young girls in the middle school grade seven we don't start with grade six but grade seven through 12 on uh, yearly um, sorts of uh, esteem building and just being comfortable with themselves and being able to say no and and knowing that no is okay and because uh, that just goes along with the drugs and the alcohol because when you t when we were growing up girls didn't get to play hardly any sports whatsoever mm. And I always joke with my wife, the, the girl basketball, was, they were six and used to have those cool right, right. big one-piece culottes and the girls would go crazy if they had to do those nowadays, rightfully <laughs> so. Yeah, but changed a lot. But when they, when female athletes, they just have a, a better self-esteem. They've developed their own self-esteem. And again, that crosses over. And more and more of the research, go, you don't see girls who are successful in athletics getting teenage pregnancies, involved in drugs, involved in alcohol, it just has an overall positive effect. Yeah, I think that's true in, uh, in you know, just in our situation, you know, you see those girls just like, you know, and it goes for the boys too, but in particular for the girls, you see those girls that are really active and I think they don't have time for some of the, the other things and they, they like to focus on their studies. Girls tend to work a little harder and uh, they focus on their studies and they focus on practicing and you know whether you like it or not there's a lot of young ladies now that are playing AAU basketball and softball and uh, getting involved and it's nice to know that they're out playing and not uh, not goofing you know, off on the weekend you know so and when you went to the AAU and, and some of the other ones when you were talking about cross country and track and we had talked earlier about how baseball is one of those that almost anybody can be successful and if they're willing to work. But cross country track, baseball, your parents don't have to be rich, like hockey or some of the other ones for you to be successful. Yeah. You guys give them the opportunity to participate, even if they're just a, from a single household or they're a working class family, they can participate. It's not restricted to the wealthy. Well, that's the two thing, nice things about Hinsdale and that it's small is, uh, you know, it, the Hinsdale Cal Ripken League, the baseball league, uh, that <laughs> provides an opportunity for girls to play up till fourth grade, about 10 years old, when they can switch over and begin softball. And for the boys, the same thing, starting at four, going through 12. And it's only $30 to participate. It's you know minimal. It basically covers the cost of a shirt and a hat for the season uh, to try and get uh, you know them outfitted with a, at least a little bit of a uniform and um, all volunteer coaches that uh, really have a high interest in the kids. And then when you get into the school system, because we're small, uh, basically if a kid wants to play and he's able to make the grade, we have a spot for them in athletics. And you know, they're welcome with open arms and we try to you know, take kids from point A to point B in their progression of their athletic skills. And, also provide them with guidance and mentors, you know, to, to help them be uh, positive and do well in school. So. You're talking about mentors. The earlier segment we were talking about with the two Swamp Bat guys mm -hmm. who hope to mentor. They're going to be working with the Cal Ripple in Hinsdale? Yep, we're really <coughs> looking forward to that. I uh, haven't ironed out all the details, but uh, what, what I envision happening is um, having them come down, uh, you know, on and off night game you know and, and during the day uh, we have a, a summer camp program at Hinsdale where we get a, probably about a hundred kids there and then also would invite the uh, Cal Ripken uh, ball players that may not be at summer camp to attend and even some junior high ball players to try and uh, get uh, you know some knowledge of uh, the actual sport but also to hear what these young men have to say because uh, you know, I think the kids need to hear from somebody closer in their age about the sacrifices that they need to make in order to excel to get to this level. You know, these guys are Division One ball players for the most part, and they don't have the time to be able to be fooling around a heck of a lot, drinking and drugging, and you know, even using chewing tobacco. So they have to, you know, they have to lead the life that's going to help them be successful. And, 
uh, that'll be really beneficial for the kids to hear and it'll be great for them to hear about how to throw the ball properly and simple mechanics of pitching. I'm really looking forward to uh, everybody having some good times and, and hopefully being able to continue this uh, for years to come. It's a, it'll be a great thing. And you were talking about division, them being Division I ball players. But it's really amazing, and I, in a lot of ways I think it's really unfair to a lot of our, our kids about how many parents who really think their Johnny or Susie mm. is going to be a Division I ball player and they're going to push Johnny or Susie for the next 10, 12 years saying that you're going to be a Division I ball player. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's it's tough because, you know, as a parent, I'm a parent. I have a 13-year-old and an 11-year-old boy, both boys, and, you know, I, I want to see them have fun. I love sports growing up and played sports all through high school and into college, and, you know, so you really want to, you know, kind of see your kids succeed, but that does put a little bit of extra pressure on kids, I think, and they can somewhat get tired of it and burnt out. So, you know, there's always that mix as a coach and a parent is when do you push the kid? How much do you push them into certain things? And when do you back off and say, you know, it's okay if you don't want to play in every all-star tournament, you know, and you want to go off to camp or something, you can, you know, you got to kind of let that go. And, you know, there were a lot of division one players before we specialized in one sport. Yep. And nowadays you see those kids that say, well, I'm not going to play soccer and baseball because I want to concentrate on basketball and just be a basketball player and you know when we were growing up that you didn't have to do that I don't think you still need to do that I think you can play all these other things and you know the chips are gonna you either got the talent or you don't so the chips are gonna fall where they may and parents I think the best thing parents can do is you know just try and foster an interest in it and if the kids have it then you let them go with it as much as you can they don't go with that, then maybe it's horseback riding. But, but the, you know, to push them in one direction, to me, doesn't make a lot of sense. You know, unless that direction is staying away from drugs and alcohol. <laughs> so, you're going to be working with the swamp bats to help reduce the alcohol <clears throat> and drug abuse among athletes. What about if I have some children who are not athletes? Uh, is there any involvement? Well, yeah, they'll hit them too. Summer camp has uh, when they come down to Hinsdale summer camp. There'll be probably 100 kids, and some kids may be involved in athletics, but others may not be. Um, and so they'll be able to have a chance to interact with all those kids at the camp at some point throughout the morning when they come around and talk to them. Um, and uh, so, you know, it, it will be just a, a sampling. And then uh, at some level, I'd like to be able to have them you know, be available during the school year, but you know, with the way the season's set up, I don't know if there's somebody local that can stick around or not, but. You're still got Ribby. Yeah, there's always Ribby. <laughs> you know, and definitely, you know, at the younger age, and that's the age to catch them, you know, and so that's the important thing is to uh, catch kids young and and just kind of hit as many as you can. And, you know, you want to give them the message in as many different ways, through ball players, through newspaper, through radio, everything that you can possibly do to uh, help educate them and make the right choice. Uh, so, you know, like I said, with, uh, with the swamp bats, it's, it's kind of a work in progress. But um, we're definitely going to try and hit as many kids as possible. Especially now when you're talking about <clears throat> during the school year, as you look at the swamp bats roster over the years, they're getting more and more ball players from the local area. Mm -hmm. So. I think a couple from Keene State, that meant some from Franklin Pierce, so right. they might be available. Right. And that would so, be great if we could get those local guys to stick around and come down and just, you know, we one of the things that Kelly and I have been researching a little bit is a program that's called Life of an Athlete. And that's not just for the athletes, it's also for coaches and, you know, to build uh, knowledge around um, what it takes to, to be a, a solid athlete, but also a person, you know. So if we can get them involved in that way too, uh, I think this, I think I've heard that the Swamp Bats have some interest in that program. So that would be another way to, to really work it uh, and hit the, you know, parents too. And like what my, one of my visions is to have the parents uh, be coming to meetings before seasons each season. And, um, you know, we would invite anybody in the school to come, but it's really directed at the athletes in the fall and the winter.
spring and reviewing what the school policies are, that if you get caught drinking, you're going to have a two-game suspension. If you get caught with chew, you're going to have a two-game suspension. If it happens again, then you have four games. And if it happens again, then it's the death penalty, you know, and you're out of the out for the year. So, you know, we need to make people aware that there's consequences. And our building principal, a uh, man by the name of John Sullivan now, is uh, some people might, I, he likes to call himself old-fashioned. And really all that means is that if there's a rule, he enforces it and follows it. And uh, that's what the students need to know about the consequences from the school perspective in sports. When you're talking about the policies, one of the policies that was brought up over the, over the past year was there was a student at one of the schools who got busted for underage drinking, got drunk. Well, they went and says, the school wanted to, to ban him from playing, but his mother goes and says, sorry, it was out of season, so it doesn't count. Mm -hmm. Isn't that kind of giving the, the wrong message too? You can get drunk as long as you're not in season? Yeah, and I think that, I'm hoping that that's kind of like what the guy said earlier, is that, you know, you gotta take care of your body, A, if you really, and it's illegal. You know, I mean, the only reason why we don't immediately suspend kids indefinitely from athletics is because we feel like I've made mistakes in my life. If I make a mistake, Give them the I deserve a second chance. Yeah. You know, and if they get to the point where there's like three times when they're drinking, then it's probably a little more serious than what we're dealing with and they need some help in, in tackling that problem. So, you know, to say that out of season doesn't matter, I mean, how can, I mean, how can you justify that? It's, uh, you know, it's against the law. You know, we had graduation parties this uh, weekend, and, uh, you know, I, the stories I'm hearing about parents allowing kids to drink because it's graduation and they're going to stay here anyways. You know, they live here, they're 18, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is it's still against the law, and especially if they're, you know, drinking and they're going to be intoxicated, they're not, they, they can still make stupid choices, they can still fall downstairs. I mean, it's just... We have to be better role models, I think. Because we go in and say, you know what, Johnny can do this, but all of a sudden it's out of season or it's after a big game, Johnny goes, has a few, Johnny gets in a car crash, kills two or three of his teammates, mm. then the parents then go to you as a coach, why didn't you prevent this? Yeah, exactly. One, but at Hinsdale, though, what we have is, um, Regardless, our contract is uh, stipulates that it's from the first day of school through through the school year, the academic year. If something happens in the summertime, then somebody's going to get away with it. But if uh, if a kid's a soccer player and they start, you know, August 15th in soccer, they sign the contract, and then if they don't play soccer, you know, basketball, or run track in the spring, if they do something at prom on May 5th and they're, they're aware of it, they have a two-game suspension from soccer the next season because it's a, a year-long, school year-long contract for us. And you're, you're asking them to make a contract and you're asking them to honor their commitment, a lifelong goal. Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah. <clears throat> Just follow through on things, something that everybody needs to do. One of the, um, the problems that we're coming up to, both at the state level and the federal level, we're looking at budget cuts. And it's so much. E it's so easy to say, well, we'll cut drug prevention or alcohol prevention because it doesn't have, it doesn't really affect much. There really is no benefit. Mm. But you're right there on the um, the sidelines. There well, has to be a benefit. Uh, as an educator, there's certainly the benefits are pretty clear. That you know, the drug and alcohol abuse. It might cost money in prevention, but it's going to cost a lot more down the road for people that abuse drugs or alcohol. Uh, you know, there's kids that have those alcohol and drug problems and they're hospitalized or have to go to rehab for them. If they had been caught earlier and they weren't in such a situation where they had to be hospitalized or into rehab, and you know, obviously there's some savings there. Um, just in the in the treatment part of the, of the student. Not to mention now, if the kid misses a quarter of school because they've been in treatment, 
they have to make up that time. That's money that, you know, school's going to be open in the summer for summer school anyways, but that's just an added piece to the system to serve those kids that have had to go through treatment. So the prevention part, it's, you know, the old saying, uh, be penny, penny wise and pound foolish, you know, is, is putting money up ahead of time to circumvent some problems. You know, people that are, most of the people that are incarcerated have not got their high school diploma and or have uh, drug or alcohol addictions. So, you know, they go hand in hand. But um, what do you say to the people who say, well, you know, those kids, they're adults, they made choices, they should suffer the consequences of their choices. It's not going to affect anybody else. Well, that's not true. It affects all of us. It's, and it's going to, it could affect us in the long run if they make a bad choice and uh, get pregnant if they're a young lady or start, you know, if they're a male, impregnate a lady and, uh, you know, they, they've got a family now at 17 or 16 or 18 and they're forced to start figuring out how to deal with that. And, and they have to worry about that youngster. So, you know, it, you can't just wash your hands of it. I, and I know that I'm not saying that we have to throw money at this problem because there's ways to fight the problem without spending a lot of money, you know, and just educating people and making sure that parents are aware of what's going on and that the school system does the best it can and the, any other community members involved do the best that they can. You know, and I think it's about, uh, at some level, it's really about relationships. Some of those people that choose alcohol or drugs, it's because they haven't had a solid relationship with, a, with a, an adult, with a, you know, maybe a mom or dad's been absent and that's They've decided to medicate themselves that way and take care of some depression. Um, these are all things that I've heard from kids, you know. The, I'm going to get ready to wrap it up. Sure. But, but two of the things that you, you hit on, but Kelly was talking. One, the research shows that a lot of kids get their alcohol from their parents because it's really available. And the a lot of other ones, kids get a lot of their drugs because mom and dad don't use all their drugs and just leave them around the house, subscription drugs. Mm. Yeah, and we've seen the same thing in our research from uh, Hinsdale High School students that parents, about half the time, either lawfully, I mean, say, sure, Joe, I'll buy you the drink, you know, the beer, or the kids take it from the liquor cabinet and they're not, you know, taking care of it. And that's where the education and awareness comes from is that you know, our parents need to understand that. And then luckily, I think uh, the prescription drug take back events that have started to take place. About 600 area, pounds were taken back. You know, and that's a really positive thing. You know, it, it puts a strain on the police system, but so I, the neat thing is that the policy and laws have already been changed because of the desire to make it work. And, you know, it's not often in government that <laughs> something is changed so that it can work better. But that's what we're seeing with the prescription drug kickbacks. We did one in Hinsdale and all around the area. So it's been a really positive thing. And hopefully, you know, the other part, like I said, is getting store owners to understand that over-the-counter drugs are the other issue. And watch, you know, we have a store owner in Hinsdale that's been great. He, he pays attention to what the students are buying and then researches it and finds out that it might have a side effect that he wasn't aware of, and he'll put it behind the counter so they don't have easy access to it anymore, or he won't sell it to 18, under 18s. So, you know, that's the kind of thing that I'm saying as a community, it didn't cost anything. It just needs to be somebody that cares about the kids and is aware of it and takes action. And the same with parents, you gotta, you gotta be vigilant. I wanna thank you. Thank you, Chris. Nice thank you for you your again. effort, and congratulations for your your growth in Hinsdale High School well, and expanding your athletics. It's having a wonderful effect. And I think people have to realize we're not Winchester, Keene, or Hinsdale. We're a community of Southern um, Cheshire County. Yep, and, absolutely. We, and what goes negative in uh, Hinsdale affects us negatively in Keene and, and vice versa. And so as we wrap up the show, I want to invite everyone out to see a Swamp Bat game this summer. It's a great field. We've got great ball players. And when I go and say, see you on the long road, well, this time it's going to be different. By the time you watch this show, 
If you're watching this show right now, I'm out there on the long road traveling across America. And so, have a good summer.